Oh my gosh. Yeah, we had some fun. Uh, I mean, I, I almost, I mean, I, I can remember one, t- one time where I was rowing and we got, we were both high siding. We were pushed up a wall and I watched water coming over the down, the bottom side or lock into the boat and i was like oh no we're gonna lose this thing roger's gonna oh no (laughs) like but we we got it off we made it through and when we were sitting sitting back in the boat rowing to safety we were both sitting in water that's how much water was in the boat so that was dave Zelinsky with a close call in mule canyon on the rogue river this story in the wooden drift boat today on the wet fly swing fly fishing show Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Dave Zelensky is here to shed light on how it all got started for him with the wooden drift boat. We, uh, Dave and I nerd out on uh, floating the Grand Canyon and some other rivers around the country. We talk about some of the great people who are leading the way in the drift boat uh, space with a focus on wood boats and... Uh, and this crazy cicada hatch uh, that Dave's been following. I'm calling him uh, the, I'm calling Dave the cicada chaser. I'm not sure if that's been coined yet, but I, I like it, cicada chaser. Koffler Boats specialize in custom ordered aluminum boats and uses the best materials, components, and accessories available to meet all of your fishing and boating needs. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Koffler to check out the lineup right now. That's Koffler, K O F. F-L-E-R, wetflyswing.com slash Koffler to check out uh, the lineup and to connect with Joe. Dave Z uh, keeps the, the Drift Boat series rolling on. So without further ado, here is David uh, Zelensky from downhomeboatworks.com. How's it going, Dave? Going awesome. How are you today, Dave? Good, good. Uh, it's great to finally put this one together. We, uh, I, I was trying to think where we first connected. I think, I don't know if it was on Instagram or maybe through uh, Roger Fletcher. We've had a few wood boat uh, episodes. Uh, do you remember where it was where we first connected? Yeah, yeah, I saw, I follow you and I've, I've listened to, I love what you're doing with the podcast and oh, stuff. Nice. So definitely had listened to a lot of them and then was like, Roger Fletcher, that's a good buddy of mine. Oh, nice. And listen to that. And the funny thing was that you had a picture for his podcast episode and it was actually a picture i took of his boat on the mckenzie river and nice. i reached out to you i was like hey i took that picture <laughs> that's and then right connected and and then went from there so that's right is that that um that beautiful brown that wooden boat on the was that which yes. boat was it that was it that and, and you know that's such a crazy thing um, in this world because there is a little bit of a story there with that that's roger fletcher's 14 foot double ender like true double ender pointed on both ends but it was built by ray heater um huh. for roger and then you know we floated the mckenzie in that so like that boat has like a lot of connections wow. and i know you you talk to ray's river dories as well so yeah. um but that boat was actually built by ray so pretty uh, cool yeah yeah i talked to um yeah ray's river dories and then uh, and also ray heater because ray has he sold the company yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I had a conversation with both. Yeah, I'm kind of slowly picking away. It's been, we've taken a little break on the drift boat season, but I've been hearing from people that, that are out there. I ran into uh, Marty, uh, who's been on the show as well, uh, oh, cool. on the river, uh, Marty. Uh, and he came down with a double ender, uh, aluminum double ender boat. And it was just, every time I see a cool different boat on the river, it's just, it's all, you know, do you get that same thing when you see a, a boat? When you're on the oh, river, yeah. do you, I, I just, I'm trying to get a picture over on our area out here. It's pretty standard what you see. It's a lot of aluminum boats. What do you see on yeah. your rivers out there? Yeah. So it, for, for your listeners, you know, I'm on the East coast, so I'm kind of, kind of funny out here on an Island, but it's, it's changing a lot. Um, you know, I've always been, been kind of uh, infatuated with the the dory and the and the wood drift boat and drift boats in general. But yeah, on on my rivers, it's a lot of fiberglass. Oh, okay. Um, so right. you see a lot of the commercial stuff. There's a couple rows around. Um, there's lots of clacker crafts, some hides, and different things like skiffs and stuff. And our water type isn't like what you guys have out there. Um, typically, we have some white water, but primarily we're talking about like big, smooth, class one, class two rivers. Yep. That's right. That's right. So, and, and the boats you build, uh, we can see them on your website, but you, you have a little mix uh, of kind of skiffs. Yeah. And I mean, what, what is, what is the most common boat do you think you, you, or what do you enjoy most? What, what boat do you enjoy most to build? 
Well, I mean, if you want to get into it, I so you, you mentioned the the double ender you saw on the river in, in aluminum, and and I I that captivates me. The the shape of a true double ender, I mean, it's just got gorgeous lines, and that's like my favorite boat. <laughs> um, but practical matters, if you look at my website and see how things kind of evolved with the plans and designs that I offer. You know, this whole boat thing is an iterative thing. We we borrow from everybody. We borrow from the the uh, guys who came before us and who's making what now. But for me, and, I, and in the East, the skiff type is huge. Um, my most popular boat by far is actually the first one that I designed for myself, which is the Drift Pram. And um, that's like it's a it's an elongated pram, if you will. It's um doesn't have a ton of rocker it's kind of flat so what you get with that is tons of displacement which means that it drafts very little and then the size of it allows you know allows you to slide it in and out of places you can't that you might not have an improved boat ramp or whatever um so it's really practical um this this is the 14 footer yeah 14 footer yeah yeah that's right yeah and that we see more and more, yeah, I think those boats are great. I mean, I think they're pretty much great everywhere. The only exception, if you did have to go into some heavier white water, they might not be the best, right? Yeah, yeah, typically lower sides. I think my side height on, on my drift pram is like 21 inches. And then, you know, the lack of rocker. The, the, you typically put the rocker in for the maneuverability, but that boat maneuvers really well anyway. So I've had it in class threes, but, you know, I... I might row a little better than that's someone right. who's not experienced. So, <laughs> I got to pitch this idea to you. This is one that I've been thinking about. And I had a we have a meeting with kind of our guys night, you know, last night, and we were talking about the Grand Canyon. I've got, I've got this fascination with the Grand Canyon. You know, I like floating it in a in a drift yep. boat. You know what I mean? And I I, I want to do it, and I want to set it up. And so my dad's got this old Ray's River Dory boat that's in the garage. Yeah, it's yeah. been sitting there, and I and I want to. What I want to do is take it down to Ray's and just say like, "Hey, let, let, we got this project, this boat. Can we can we deck this thing over and get it ready for the Grand Canyon?" And yeah. then you know what I mean. And then t- and it is the Mackenzie style, I think, or maybe yeah. it's not. That was the thing. I always get confused because I know Ray Heater was talking about how his boats. I think he had some that were more uh, Rogue River style. Do you do you remember what Ray what he made? Yeah, I, I mean, so Ray Ray had definitely a Mackenzie style. Yeah, he did. The, the, his. His Woody Hindman was a like true fifteen something foot double ender, pointed both ends, lots of rocker. But then he all he also made those like those Mac series, which were almost like my drift prams, but you know obviously came before me. Um, and those were like square enders. Talking to Roger, you know, you go back in the history the the Rapid Robert, which I know you've had a lot of conversation on, is a is a big kind of downriver facing front transom and. That's part of that evolution. But what you're saying about the Grand Canyon, I like my heart rate rises when you start talking about that because that's on my list too. There you go. So maybe there maybe go. we ought to band together. Here exactly. Well, one. well, you maybe you be uh, Marty. I know he's been putting in. I think I'm going to start putting in for the you know the lottery thing. Oh and, man! And if we could do it, I'll, I'll definitely uh, add you to the list. So if if oh. we get if we get them, I'll circle back around to you. Well, oh, maybe I should put in for it too. Then. Yeah, I don't even know how it works. My guess is, you know, it's just kind of. I think it's a lottery. I don't think you get points. I think it's just random, right? Every year, yeah. if you want to. But I know uh, Marty and Mia went down this last year, so they've they're probably getting things dialed in a little bit. And um, yeah, man, I hear you. I'd love to. I see those. I had this little period I went through where I, I couldn't stop watching those videos of the drift boats going upside down and then flipping them over. Which yeah, is, you. you I've, yeah. You've probably seen a lot of my buddies doing that too. Greg Hatton is one. He built oh, the yeah. uh, he built a Portola kind of recreation, like right down to the paint, and he did that. And uh, there's other guys like uh, I, I know what you're talking about with your rays. I think Rob Grubb did. He decked out a 16 foot double or a 16 foot double under with a transom and ran the Grand Canyon oh, maybe cool. a few times. So. Oh wow! Now who is this? Uh, Rob Grubb. Uh, he, Pro, I I did a trip and he was on it, uh, and he did the we, it was on the rogue, and I believe he teaches like rowing. Oh, cool! I'll, ch- I'll look at him. I'll look him. Yeah, up. I'll give you contact there. He's a great guy and probably the finest rower I've seen. There you go. 
like one oar stroke through tough stuff and it's like this guy just magic oh man it's amazing <laughs> yeah this is well th- this is obviously this conversation starting off like we could just uh-huh. just do this the whole time which is uh, which is amazing i do want to circle back because i like to keep a little bit of get a little bit of uh you know kind of where you're coming from so so take us i, I know you're in uh, you're in pa but um so let's go to fly fishing let's, let's just switch this thing it's, it's go back yeah. to the fly fishing How, how'd you get into fly fishing uh i i always loved fishing my dad um who was like my biggest hero fished and loved to fish. And I watched anything fishing all the time. I, I thought about it constantly. I, I had the the benefit to live, to grow up and live on Lake Erie, um, kind of within eyesight of it. So always having the ability to have water around and fishing around. And my dad took me fishing a lot. And I think when I was about 10, I like bagged and bagged and bagged for a fly rod and my dad took me to a sportsman's show and I got my very first fiberglass South Bend uh, kit with a foam handle, you know, two piece fiberglass rod, foam handles, level line and a clicker reel and um, uh, Barry and Kathy Beck. I don't know if you know those names. They're pretty um, big photographer, outdoor writers. They were at that show, I remember, and she gave me a box of flies and I begged my dad to take me fishing like that week. And uh, I caught I, the first fish I caught on a fly rod was a steelhead, a oh, Lake wow. Erie steelhead. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, from there, completely hooked and yeah. uh, never, never kind of looked that, back. So. so you've been going strong the whole time. And then, oh, yeah. and then when did the, uh, the drift boat fascination start? So it would have been like in the, in the late 90s, you know, like out of college, working you know, family starting, you know, ha- having a young family and a house and kind of all the, all the adult grown up stuff and started to look at like, I'm, I, I moved South from Lake Erie down to like, um, I'd say East of the Pittsburgh area. So Southwestern Pennsylvania in around here, lots of rivers, lots of great, like smallmouth rivers and some great trout water as well. And started to fish those rivers, but they're deep, fast. Um, you know, you wait around and started thinking, like, I need a, I need a boat. <laughs> I need a boat to fish this stuff. And um, obviously had gone on a few Western trips and, and seen drift boats and been in and around, like, modern fiberglass ones. And my another another part of it is my, my dad and my grandfather were really, um, like, woodworkers, and they, they knew – all about tools. And so I, I grew up building things my whole life. So it kind of came natural. And I started looking around on the internet on like drift boats and came across wood ones. And that's, that's actually how I met Roger Fletcher. Um, and he was at the time selling like historic plans from, you know, all the early boats. It was early in when he was writing his book and it wasn't even out yet. So um, he was super helpful, got me started. And I said, wow, I can't afford at the time to buy a drift boat, but, and I can build anything. So let's give it a shot. <laughs> so that's amazing. Built, yeah. The first one I built was, a uh, was like your boat. It was a 16 foot, 48 inch bottom double yep. under with a transom. Wow. Kind of what, what everybody thinks of when they, they hear drift boat, you know? So the double under with the transom basically means, it, it would have two points, but the transom means that it, it's mm-hmm. actually flat on the back. Yeah, the small transom the in small, the back. Yeah, the small. Yeah, the small. And they did that. And remind us again. So why the double ender was to get through white water forwards and backwards, right? But what? Why was the double ender? Why did they put the flat on the back? Yeah, I mean, according to to like Roger, who's like the historian on all this stuff, like I guess Woody Hyman, who who was making double enders at the time, somebody asked him like, "Hey, to get through the flat sections of river, boy, I'd like to motor." So they just lopped it off, flattened it off as little as they they needed to, and you could mount a motor yeah, on the it back. Was a motor, yeah, it was a motor, and then and then gear wise, when you think of these double enders, I mean, because if you have two points without the flat transom. You can still get plenty of gear in the back, right? Yeah, yeah. I have a um, I have a sixteen foot double ender with a transom right now, and it, it's it's just as big. There's just as much room, and the, and those boats don't really like fish with a a, a great like a, a rear passenger too well. So I don't put someone back there anyway. They're really two person boats, so you just pile all that gear behind the rower seat. 
So basically, yeah, and you're doing these boats now, and they're beautiful. And I mean, you go to the website, and then I mean, it it looks like they're you know I, I can't even tell a difference, right? I see Rogers boats or the, all these other ones. I mean, what did it take you? I mean, t- tell us about that first boat. I mean, what, do you still have that first boat? Um, I so the first boat I built, the yeah, with yeah. So no, actually, but my one of my best friends, Bob Bell, um, who still lives back up north on in, on Lake Erie, he owns it. So how the evolution of this stuff with me and building wood boats is, is I built one and you know, everybody has their, their core group of fishing buddies and they're all like, Hey, build me one and build me one. And, and before you know it, you're making boats for everybody. But for the way I did it was, you know, we built, I built this first boat, beat it up for two or three years and sold it to him at a, at a bargain price so that I could build another one. And, and then that one went to somebody else and I built another one. And then we started to, started to fish around different rivers without those kind of improved uh, launch points and takeouts. So I kind of evolved the idea of we need something smaller. We need something that doesn't really take up much space and flatter. And that's where the drift pram kind of evolution came out of, of kind of necessity. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so you guys, and those, those boats, so the 14 are the one that's easy to get. I mean, can you, a few guys just pick that thing up? Yeah. We fit the drift pram in like a, if you have a full size pickup truck, like a Tundra or Chevy or Ford, that'll slide right in back. Now it's not light, right? It's probably 160 pounds dry, but in, in big and cumbersome, but you can do it. Um, and we've done it and traveled pretty far up to northern Michigan and not having to drag a trailer around is pretty nice. So what do you think is the advantage? You know, we all, we've talked about this too with, with, I think Roger, but you know, the, the wood and versus the fiberglass versus aluminum, you know, what what do you, what do you love about the wood? I, I just, they grow so much better. They draft less and they're, they're so much lighter in your hands on the oars. Uh, and the response that you get, you know, with, with an oar stroke is so much better. Right. And, and, and why is that explain? Cause it, I mean, maybe that is obvious it's wood, but is that as straightforward as it is? I mean, just wood is a natural material. It's better in water. You know, I, um, I don't know. I think, I think there's some of that to it. I think some of it's the design and the simplicity of the designs. I think a lot of like modern boats and I'll disclaimer, they're great. I think what, what all the manufacturers are doing are fantastic for like their interiors and their layouts and everything. I think they're fantastic and they definitely fit a need for me. I like the wood. I like the the traditional look. I like the feel, but I, as far as performance wise, I do think wood is a big part of it. Um, it's buoyancy. It inherently floats. It doesn't sink like if you throw a piece of aluminum in the water, it sinks. Right. <laughs> if you, you if you uh, throw a piece of wood in the water, it floats. So I think there's that aspect of it. Um, and, uh, and I, I do think design elements too are, are really important. You can, you can design a, a really nice hull and then outfit it with so much weight inside. Now it doesn't perform really well. Mm. So if you kind of keep things simple, keep things light, and you know balance your your load and and balance your interior appointments you can make a you can have both you can have performance you can have everything performance looks feel everything right right yeah that's always i mean that's a big question i have when i think about this It, it looks like to me i've never built a boat um and i know you have plans and and i guess kits as well but it seems like a challenge. I mean, if somebody is, a, you had some wood boat experience, if it was somebody coming in who hadn't built a boat before and they were going to go to your website and I guess that, you know, grab some plans, how, how doable is that? You know, I've coached a lot of people virtually and around the world, actually, that are first time builders. I get that email a lot like, hey, I've never built a thing. And, and it's a lot of people that are the, like how I got into it. You know, they want a drift boat, they want a boat, but, and the, the sticker shock of buying like a package from, you know, one of the manufacturers is like, 10K, it's just 15K. not affordable. Yeah. Yeah. It's not affordable to me. So I, I, I'm, they're like on the fence of like, I think I can do it. And then you, like, can I do it? And, and I can certainly afford it. Right. So, um, yeah, first time builders, like I'm, I'm pretty clear on my website, like, my plans are plans. They're not instructions, but there's so much written on the topic of building a drift boat. 
I constantly reference like Roger's book has a great section on modeling, meaning building a scale model the same way you would build the real thing. And that's always a great first step. Even if you build it out of like poster board and tape and, you know, to spend a night doing it on the kitchen table with scissors, like it gives you some confidence um, to construction methods. Um, but, you know, I try to, to communicate that you don't need like this big grand wood shop. I built one of my boats just to, to like prove that point with completely hand tools. And yeah, it took a little longer. Um, it, it was a little slower. Um, it was a little tougher in ways, but it totally can be done. So, you know, I, I get questions all the time, like, how do I do it? Like, uh, what do I need to do? And, and I walk people in, in the process and had phone calls with people. I'm, you know, totally there for support to, to, to see somebody be successful. And, you know, when you're building the boat, you're building a lot of memories. You, you remember the process, you remember your first time out and you remember, you know, all those great big fish you caught and you know days you were caught in the rain <laughs> right right yeah so. so so you have the plan on your site you have the plan so somebody can get the plans but you don't necessarily sell the step-by-step -step how to do it from a to a to z yeah i have a really brief construction guide that i get feedback on all the time and i update and edit and things and and you know and i, and I solicit back to, to folks who've built a boat I often get a lot of pictures from people who build it and then I'll ask them like, Hey, how, how did you think you could do this when you started and how helpful was the materials I provided? And, you know, most folks have, have responded with some feedback and, um, positively and, and, you know, you know, saying you know, your availability and, um, other resources on the internet, um, uh, Roger's book have been very helpful. So, yeah. Okay. So that's basically, you can, and the plans that you have are the things we've talked about. Some just basically what you've made. You've got the 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 river skiff yeah. and some of the other boats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only only designs that are mine. Yeah. So every every boat that you see there is a design that's my own. Um, so yeah, I've built every one of those boats, designed them for a purpose, and built several of them, and 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 then released the plans for for someone else who wants to build one. Got Where would somebody go? So if they want the full, you know, to get the kit, I mean, so if they get your plans, they basically have to go and just get the wood and get all that stuff together on their own. Yeah. So there are people yeah. out there though, that will send you like, just, you know, mail you the full kit. Um, that, yeah, I've had a couple, uh, cases of that, that, um, so folks are like, Hey, I want, I want a kit. Like I, I like all the cuts and everything. And that's, so there was, there's a few people that do that really well or, and have done that historically really well. Like Greg Tapman, who I think changed hands a few times and is like back in business. And, um, you know, there, there was, uh, Don Hill, they would oh, yeah. offer kits and they were extremely, yeah, extremely well done. Um, my, myself, it's like, it's, it's almost like custom work. So if I were to do a kit, I kind of try to talk people out of the kit, but part, but go to partial kits. Um, the, probably the hardest thing in building a, like a, a traditional style framed drift boat is actually making the frames. Your plywood cuts are straight. They're pretty easy. You just draw a line, snap a chalk line and cut it with a handsaw. Uh, but when you're making frames, you have, you know, angles and bevels on the bottoms and the sides of the frames and tapers, and they do have to be precise it's like a skeleton that you're going to skin around with the plywood to to make the shape of that boat so um the best possible way for somebody who maybe doesn't have the confidence of like the whole project is reach out to me and buy a frame kit now with the frame kit you'll get all the frames made but not assembled i'll assemble them and then take them down take them apart for shipping and then it includes a set of, set of plans as well so that you have all the plywood pieces. And really what you do there is you screw the, the frames together and then get your plywood and then start forming it around the, around the frames to make the hull. Oh, to make, so you actually have a frame, so you will ship a framed kit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, frame kit, yeah. Okay, which is different than just like the full kit. Uh, that's, full kit, yeah. I see. Well, yeah, it sounds like the frame kit is a, is a huge, I mean, that's a big step 
Yeah, that's a big part. Yeah, making frames is. Uh, I, I have like jigs and fixtures that that help me make them pretty quickly. But for like a one-time builder, if you're going to build one boat, you're not going to make jigs and fixtures. You're going to do everything by hand, and you're going to you know make your cuts one at a time and things like that. So it's a um, you know it's a long part of that process, and it's it's kind of the precise part of the process. So what you would do, you buy that kit, and then you you could go buy your own plywood and and cut your plywood, but you would have the frames that I made that I'll, you know, kind of guarantee that they're going to work and make the boat shape right. Shape right, which is the big thing. Yeah, that, that seems like the way to go, especially if you haven't ever done it before. Seems like you could get the design, I mean, easily a little bit wrong, and then, God, your boat might, right, might not even float right. Yeah, I mean, in boat building, we, we joke, you know, we're not working to really super high precision, like you're an eighth of an inch precision. So you can be off a little bit, but you want those lines. That's and like you want the aesthetic lines. So you don't want to see like kinks and like wonks, we call them like in the bends. You want a nice curved, smooth line that's really pleasing to the eye. And that's what a properly like made frame kit gets you frame kit well that sounds like okay so we got you got the plans which is amazing and then and then so you could say it's the double ender you want to go with the double ender and then you have this kit so you could literally somebody could buy the kit from you you could send it out and now you the kit would be this frame kit so now you just like you said you get the the wood and then you start digging into and you even have a little bit of a setup to get going but probably grabbing roger's book as well would be a big help if you're going to do it um what else what else would you need to know about before you jumped into this yeah, I mean, I can't stress enough, like, safe tool use. So, you know, you, using basic tools, you're going to use a hammer, you're going to use screwdrivers, you can use a drill, a uh, circular saw, um, and then, you know, anything else if you have it, like belt sander, a bandsaw would be kind of helpful at times, a uh, table saw would be helpful. So safe tool use. Um, you know, if if <laughs> it's funny, if you've done, like, normal home improvement projects, like uh, maybe, like, trimmed a doorway uh, or trimmed a window frame you you can do this that's it which yeah, which i haven't not, really which I, i'm not really oh, that good oh, at. Geez. i just took you out <laughs> yeah exactly i'm out of the mix no, i mean I, I try to it's funny i i mean i'm thinking of this more of the somebody who's listening and i would love to do it. i'm just not sure if i even have the uh you know the skill or, or, or patience to do it right you know what i mean it's definitely a handy thing like you, you know you got it I've had uh, like two or three people come in really cold. Like I've never built a thing. I own a drill and, and they actually made really nice boats and there you go. They, they're like completely satisfied with and on the water. And what did they get? Did they get the kit? Did they get the, the frame and all that? No, they actually went straight up plans, um, and built it themselves. Yeah. From scratch. There you go. So, yeah. it's, so it's doable. Yeah. It's totally doable. So you have, it seems like you have this uh, plan and Roger had, I remember when Roger was talking about his model, which I really wanted to get one of those, but I don't think he really sells them anymore. I think, Ro, you know, Roger's obviously getting, getting a little older and stuff, but it sounds like you're kind of filling maybe a gap there, right? You learned, do, do you look at Roger as maybe you're a, a big like main mentor in this whole process? Yeah, I mean, Roger's huge. And then as you get into this little community, you start learning everybody else. And then if you're fortunate enough to go on a trip with a bunch of guys, like there are some amazing, amazing folks out there. And we bounce ideas across each other and stuff. And there's some innovations happening. And you, you've, you've talked to a lot of those guys, but totally Roger got me into it. You know, Roger's come and visited me here in Pennsylvania. And I visited him a few times. Um, Roger, funny story with Roger, he, he gave Greg Hatton and I, um, who Greg Hatton does uh, wooden boat adventures.com. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, yeah, he, he's great, but he, um, he gave Greg and I coordinated for us to do a trip on the rogue and gave, uh, loaned us that, that 14 foot double ender to oh, take wow. down the road. Oh, that's so like gave us a boat to take down a pretty wild <laughs> whitewater river. You know, what's amazing about that is that the Rogue, and I've been down it a number of times, it's like the uh -huh. one river that I go down with my drift boat that I, I always go into it thinking, okay, I'm probably going to hit a few rocks and just because yeah. it's the Rogue. And then, but did you guys, I mean, the wood boat, that's always my thing with the wood boat. I mean, how did you hit rocks on that trip? Oh my gosh. Yeah. We had some fun. Uh, I mean, I, I almost, 
I mean, I, I can remember one t- one time where I was rowing and we got we were both high siding. We were pushed up a wall and I watched water coming over the down the bottom side or lock into the boat. And I was like, oh, no, we're going to lose this thing. Roger's going to. Oh, no. <laughs> like, but we we got it off. We made it through. And when we were sitting, sitting back in the boat, rowing to safety, we were both sitting in water. That's how much water was in the boat. So well, like like a like a like a couple feet of water in the boat. Oh, like, yeah, over a foot. foot so you half, almost swamped like up it. Up to the seats. Oh, yeah, we were totally buried. Yeah, but we we did not flip or anything. But we got out of that. And uh, yeah. some moments of silence there. Some Wow. Some, you know, fun stuff. But, yeah, Roger loaned us loaned us that beautiful boat to take down and trusted us with us. But, um, yeah, the Rogue was great. Do you remember what rapid that was that you almost swamped it? Mm, it was ahead of Mule Creek Canyon, but it was before Blossom, so before I don't Blossom. remember. Yeah, I know. There's so many. I could find it. Yeah, it's all right. I, I always think, I even I, I try to remember the rapids, and yeah, you remember Blossom and the Mule Creek, uh, that canyon, but um, damn, that would have been, well, that's great. That's a good, uh, happy ending to that one. <laughs> yeah, Which... yeah, it was the best possible outcome. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, well, I guess I'm uh, just thinking. Here, I, I was kind of, you know, coming into this, obviously trying to think of somebody who wants to get into this a little bit. Uh, it, you know, we've touched on a little bit. I mean, I was kind of thinking also fly fishing accessory or fly uh, drift boat accessories, right? Like things that go along with it. But I mean, what goes along with the kit, the boat? Are there other things to be thinking about here that you might, as as far as accessories? Or I mean, when you when you do your plans, there's not much to it, right? I mean, you build the boat and then you can fill it with whatever you want, or when when you hear when you hear drift boat accessories, what comes to your mind? Um, yeah, you definitely need a anchor system um, is key, but like I don't make manufacture those or design any of those. I think the stuff that's out there is awesome. So the Dirk system or Bose foot release and all that stuff, or you can do a, you know, you can do like a side release and stuff that goes along the rail. Gotta have that because if you're gonna anchor and set up on fish that are maybe rising or whatever you got to be able to stop the boat and, and sit um definitely oars um i make my own oars um yeah um i make my own oars out of fur or ash and um but i know like you can buy some great oars like sawyer makes great oars they're super balanced and you know durable the kevlar tips and stuff i love that um and i uh I don't have any, but I, I love those. And maybe a set is in my future. Um, let's see other accessories. You know, a lot of guys are that I, that I sell plans to are outfitting their boats with like coolers for front seats, which I think is a great thing and space saving thing. Um, you know, with some of like the big name coolers and stuff, I do caution a little bit, like don't go so big that you're adding like a hundred pounds to your boat. Like you want to, you want to keep it light. <laughs> um, some of those coolers are just, just so heavy what happens when you put if say one of your boats you know i don't know the 16 foot or whatever when you overload it i mean how, how do you know i guess weight wise but how do you know when you've overloaded a boat how, how do you tell what do you tell people yeah so for me you know and i know how my boats row so i you want you want to balance the weight in the boat so you're so if you're gonna if you're gonna say i'm gonna row and you're gonna be up front and then we're gonna take a whole bunch of gear for whether it's an overnight or a big trip or something you know, we'll get in that boat and I'll kind of check. And like, so if we took like my, my double ender design, the, the Pennsylvania drifter, um, which is kind of a modified double ender from what you see, it has a little bit less rocker and it's kind of more suited for the water I have out here. But I'll look at that. It's the way I have it designed is if, if you have two people in it and some gear, I look at the front end and I want that the bottom of the stem post out of the water. Just, I mean, even if it's just an inch, that's, that's enough balance to keep it, to keep the performance up and like your rowing ability solid. So shift the weight around, like move stuff into the back or move stuff up under the front deck, um, move it up under the front seat, whatever you got to do to, to keep it balanced. You don't want to be doing like a, you don't want everything in the back where you're doing like a wheelie down a wheelie, the, and you don't want the other way. And you don't want it the other way. So trying to keep it centered so you're kind of where you're like below your oar locks is important, right? So right below your oar locks, that's your kind of your pivot point of where you're, you know, propelling the boat. So you want the balance there. You want to 
feel that you're getting maximum kind of efficiency when you're rowing. So where you weight the boat to keep that balance is really important. Yeah, that's it. And I always think of it as, like you're saying, in the front of the boat at the bottom versus the back, kind of having those roughly equal. Like, say, if you had four inches out in the front, you maybe you have four inches in the back, something like that, just to keep it balanced. That's Yeah, yeah that's a good starting point. Some of the boats are a little, like, just because of bottom design on mine, like you want maybe a little bit more out of the water in the back. Um, but yeah, that's a good starting point for sure. And then it just has you feel it. Yeah. And then that's the thing. That's a, somebody told me, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Koffler. Uh, but he was saying, you know, the boat I have is kind of made to carry quite a bit of weight and it does pretty well with a lot of weight, but you know, you kind of put your boat in and then you could tell when it's balanced, right. You know, adjusted and then oh, yeah. You f- yeah, you'll feel the rowing. You'll be like, Oh, okay. That, yeah, that feels, that feels good. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, super important there. Okay, so if we stay on this accessory uh, piece, I just want to, again, check off the boxes here. So, yeah, we got the anchors, we got um, the oars. I mean, other stuff, I guess there's the little stuff, right? It, it, the cool thing about the wood boat, you could build anything, right? You could build in a, I mean, you're probably not going to put a heater in there, but you could build in all sorts <laughs> of, like, cup holders. And, yeah. uh, I don't, what, what else would you put? I mean, your boat's got to be, uh, do you go kind of fancy boat where you've just got all these kind of no. bells and whistles? No. I am super old school in almost every way. In oh, almost every so your boat is a cool, it's like so an funny. old traditional boat. Yeah, I have slatted floorboards. I do have level floorboards. So, le- so if you understand level floorboards, if you if you look at a drift boat from the side, um, you know, it has the rocker, and the rocker would be like that crescent shape, front to back, right? So if you imagine now looking through that boat and, and just put like where the floorboards would be, they can either follow that shape of rocker or they can be flat, like straight, like horizontal. And, and I, I like mine horizontal because like think of it, if you're standing in the front of the boat and the floorboards match the bottom, your ankles are going to be like facing upward. You're like toes going to be pointing up. It's like not an uncomfortable thing all day. So I like I like level floorboards. Um, that's the only kind of departure from like the traditional norm. Like I, I have, um, my boats are really, really set out. I have a little storage under the front seat, like a hinged top where you can put some stuff. Um, and then I have the, the traditional style rope seat for the rower seat, which I really love. I don't know if you're, do yeah. your, does your, yeah, it is okay. rope. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so comfortable and it like in rain, you're not sitting in a puddle. Oh it's, yeah. It's, that's just one of the rope. Great. Yeah. Why is the rope great? And that's it because it, it basically does, it dries quick or whatever compared to say you could do a, what, what other type of seat could you have there? I know a lot of guys are doing like webbing, like yeah, webbing. even if it's like, um, NRS straps or something like that, like that's a great comfortable seat and you can get those really tight. So they're, they're nice and firm. That feels good. But then a lot of, a lot of folks put like aftermarket seats in that you would see like in a clack or a hide or coffler or row, like the formed, you know, plastic seats that are comfortable. Um, as I get older, uh, a little bit of back support is welcome. So, um, you know, anything like that is really helpful. Um, and then you can have, you can have like seat backs for like my boats are the ones, my personal boats are super traditional. So I have like the removable seat backs, like you see in the old photos, like where you can lean on them. And, um, but I do have an anchor system in all my boats. Like that's mandatory. And then, um, yeah, have a spare, have a spare oar. you never know when you're going to need it. Yeah. Spare or uh, maybe a spare, uh, or lock. Oh yeah, definitely spare oar locks. I've uh, bent and broke them. Um, and then a drain plug. I put drain plugs in my boats, um, which is a departure from kind of traditional ways. Traditional ways, you would bail your boats. Oh really? So there's no drain plug in a traditional boat? Pretty much, no. I think that was like, a, you know, kind of a, uh, maybe a nice to have later on. But like the early ones, like I know Roger's boats don't have them. Like he had a he had a he had a I think a Keith Steele built by Marty original from the fifties double ended with a transom no no drain plug his definitely his fourteen footer that we took down the road built by Ray was no drain plug I put I put sometimes two drain plugs in my boat um, and uh, I put them on it's it's a cool thing I so if you think of like how a road is crowned on a highway right. It's like high in the middle and you drive on the right side. So that right, that right berm is lower. 
So when my boat's on the trailer, I put my drain plug there at the lowest part of the boat. So it's the lowest part of the boat typically is like right in front of the rower on the floor. So on the right side. So when I trailer my boat, I take that drain plug out and it's dry by the time I get home. It's like all the water goes to that side and it's the lowest point. So, um, and then the, the other beauty there is you can see it. So when you get in your boat and it's in the water and you don't have your drain plug in, you have this fountain <laughs> coming up at your feet. So, uh, yeah, you see yeah, that's, that's right. I always think about that. Yeah. You do, that's definitely one thing you don't want to forget putting in the, in the river, right? Your, your drain plug. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Okay. So, yeah. so, um, well, I mean, this is, this is cool. I, I love the, Obviously, we've had a few episodes on the wood, but I'll put links to, to those. You know, we've mentioned a few of them. And I'm still just c- continuing on this drift boat season because I love, you know, talking to people, kind of like we're doing BS in here a little bit. And so you mentioned some other people. So there, that crew out there of these wooden drift boat folks, uh, how many of them are there out there that are doing similar things to what you're doing? Maybe they're selling, maybe they're not, but are there, yeah. are there hundreds and hundreds? Or like, how big is this thing? I, you know, I don't. I don't know if it's hundreds. I mean, private builders. Yeah, there's hundreds because I, I know because of the, the plans that I'm selling. But um, like guys building and carrying that torch, man, I tell you, there's there's one guy who I mean, there's a there's not, I, don't, I shouldn't say one guy, but there's a couple guys. You already talked to uh, Jason. Yeah, uh, I was going to say Jason. And, yeah. Oh, my gosh. His yeah. He's he's like he's that top level, right? His stuff is just phenomenal. And you talk about accessorizing. Right, accessorizing. Yeah. I mean, but his st- his style, right, that whole uh, stitch and glue, right, is totally different than yes. what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, he's 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 innovative too. I mean, he the, what he's doing with bottoms, with different materials, and uh, just, I mean, he's casting his own brass at times for, or bronze for, for, for parts and pulleys. Um, so there's also like Brad Dimmick. Oh yeah, Dimmick, right. Think, yeah, yeah, he's also building, and he's like Grand Canyon guy. And then there's uh, a guy you might have not talked to, uh, Jason Hayes. Oh, Jason Hayes. Yeah, I think I've talked to him, or I haven't had him on yet. Yeah. But I think we chatted. Yeah, I think he's in Eugene. I think I I DM'd you like his name. And I'm 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 glad you reached out to him, but he's phenomenal. Like as far as the traditional style framed boats, he had one on the Rogue on that trip I mentioned. I mean, the absolute most gorgeous frame boat I think I've seen and flawless paint job, flawless joinery. He's building the boats for Helfrich now, which is pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, it's always great to see what what Jason's doing. And, you know, he and I spent time on that trip together, and then we kind of talked through through kind of social media and text and stuff. But, you know, great guy, fishing guy, kind of. He's, he's another one to talk to because kind of similar to me, you know, it was just fishing around it and wanted a boat and mm-hmm. decided building it was the way to go. But now he's he's actually producing boats and, and he's doing phenomenal work. So always love to, to see these guys get like, you know, and I, I thanks for the opportunity here for myself. But like you're this podcast and like the whole drift boat thing has been great to hear. You know, you've talked to Koffler and, and, you know, all of the manufacturers and it's just so cool. Even the raft stuff like, uh, like Bobby and at RMR and yeah. And oh yeah. You so, know, you know, Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's, yeah. it's been fun. I know I've, I've kind of, I've slowly been widening a little bit, you know, because I, I guess, I, I don't know. I, I'm go, I'm following my interests as well. You know, it's like, yeah, I think if I'm interested in something, there's probably a few people that probably love hearing about boats as well. So, you Absolutely. know, might as well dig into it, but no, those are amazing. And I, I think Jason would be great. And Dimmick, the funny thing about Dimmick, we had a little bit of a, a, a audio. Uh, it was the one time where we, I can't remember exactly what happened, uh, but it was, but we did, we didn't put it together. And so I'm hoping. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping I can swing back around to Dimmick and and get him. Yeah. Along. He. Oh, you. If you. Uh, if you do like that's. I mean, uh, you probably follow him and look at all his stuff. But the the Grand Canyon stuff is the center of it all. It seems like. So I'm always looking at his stuff and going like, ah, oh, he just put a post there headed down the canyon. I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to see what comes out of this. That, in that three almost weeks. exactly. See, that's <laughs> almost that's the thing with social. It almost hurts to right see that sometimes because uh-huh. you're like, oh so far away yeah. from that place yeah but i want to be there where else would you other than the the grand canyon yeah the middle fork for sure um i was looking at stuff on the cellway but maybe not i, I actually have an rmr raft as well so oh cool 
Yeah, I was thinking like, mm, the Selway looks pretty awesome. <laughs> um, Middle Fork and, uh, you know, and, and it's fun because I guess in like early on, it was for me, it was all about fishing and where to go fishing. And now, like it's definitely over the last maybe, you know, I guess seven, eight years, it's been running rivers too. And, and, you know, focusing on that and it does like fishing is not necessarily the primary draw anymore. So I do love to fish and still like, that's a huge part of it, but the, uh, river running stuff, like I want to see a lot of stuff. So definitely Grand Canyon. Um, I was just telling my friend just yesterday, like, when I turn 50, that's Grand Canyon time for me. Like that's a couple of years. So, um, we're right on the same, you know, we're right on the same track. Are we, we? Well, I've got my, my group and we're all getting close to, you know, 50 isn't too far away. And, and we're like, okay, what, what's going to be our 50, 50 trip or, or celebration. And we're talking about going up to Alaska for like a multi-week, uh, remote, you know, trip down one of those rivers. And we, you know, we won't be taking a drift boat, but we'll have some rafts and, so yeah, you got. But if you get that permit, if you get that permit on your fifty year, you gotta go. Oh so. no, yeah, we're dropping it. We're <laughs> dropping everything. Yeah, no, we're, we're heading there for sure. It's a, because that trip is crazy, yeah. right? I mean, that's a that's a two, three week trip. Commitment. Right? Yeah, twenty one days, eighteen days. days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's intense. So I'm so I'm. Yeah, slowly... I, I'm like you. We probably uh, our uh, our YouTube history is probably the same. Like I have fallen into that vortex for hours yeah. of Grand Canyon running whether it's rafts stories whatever yeah i know <laughs> yeah I know. It's, just, it's just massive water and i think you know looking at it i mean i've been through and you've been through some stuff you know obviously there's technical and then there's just big massive waves it's, it looks just like ride it yeah just ride it <laughs> right it's like martin linton we had uh, that episode where we talked about martin linton and uh, uh, yeah. the Emerald Mile, right? I mean, that book. I hope to get oh, him yeah. on as well, the guy that um, that wrote that uh, book. Ken Fredarco, yeah. Yeah, Fredarco. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, but, yeah, just that story, right? And, and the whole thing is just a, an amazing story of that canyon and, and the boats. And But you can see when you look at those videos – I could, you could see, and it's the wave. Sometimes you have no control, but you could see where the mistakes are made because, oh, the boat, yeah. right? They hit this wave, and you can just see the waves kind of a little sideways, and then that's all it takes, and then boom, they're uh-huh. upside down. Have you ever been? They're in the hole. Have you ever been upside down in 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 uh, in a rapid? In a out of a boat, boat or a raft? No, thankfully, but oh yeah, I just I just pinned a raft four weeks ago. Oh yeah, so you have? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> was it the so was it the R what what's the RMR? What what size what do you have there? I have the I so I have the ten and a half storm, um, which I I'm in love with. I mean I, I I'm s- for small water, carry ins, carry outs, and then where I live we have the Yakagani River, which is less than an hour away. And it's a there's class four whitewater there, and it's a very popular river and it's just like rapid after rapid. So it's a, such a recreational good time. And, um, so like, I was like, I bought the RMR cause I was like, we can, we can R for it, um, for people. Um, and then I bought a down river frame for it that I can fish and I have fish. I just had it out last week and going to have it out this weekend. So, um, it's so that's what I said, like my interests, you know, are constantly evolving. I, you know, fishing wise, I totally prefer to be in a wood drift boat. Um, this river that I mentioned, there's no good, there's no proper put in or take out. So like you can't trailer a drift boat down to it and you can't trailer one out of it. So you got to carry kayaks, carry rafts, carry, carry, you know, rubber stuff out of it. Um, not, not that I say I would take a drift boat down it right away yet. Um, but yeah, you know, always evolving, always changing interests. Do it all. Yeah, have fun with it. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you, and I love the D, the DRA. I didn't even, I wasn't that familiar with them. I know uh, we when our uh, NRS episode they mentioned downriver equipment, yeah. and I mean, so is that is that frame just amazing? It, it's a good frame. Yeah, I mean, I'm I again simple in a lot of things that I do. So like the ten and a half storm is a small boat. Yeah, small boat. Um, yeah, and I just have like a. I have a yeah. front bay, which I put a plywood deck on, and then I have a rear rower seat or locks. And it's for two people going down a small river or even a big river, fishing, carrying a little bit of gear. It's it's, it's exactly perfect. what I need. And I, I kind of got it too. Like I have plans to, you know, drive west and throw yep. that, roll that up in the back in. and 
yeah i just that's why it's great you know, kind of do that yeah that's why it's yeah. great yeah the, the boat i don't mind pulling a drift boat uh, too you know really yep. much at all because you get a good trailer but but yeah pulling something is always an extra thing if you could roll it up and throw it, the frame on top and that, that makes it a little bit better yeah. especially on a long road yeah. trip yeah, I can get that whole boat, in fact, on top. I have a Tacoma with a cap, so I can get that whole boat put together on top of the Oh, wow. It's, it's pretty awesome. That's right. Yeah, I think I remember Bobby yeah. saying something on that episode. This is cool, man. This is what we're soaking around. The more we talk, it's like, oh, man, all these yeah. episodes, you know what I mean? We, I already did. I already, I forget. It's funny, you know, after doing 250 episodes or whatever, you you start to forget. You know, you don't forget about them completely, but yeah. you're just, you have to be reminded sometimes. Yeah, I love I love how it all kind of comes like you're closing the loop on this stuff. Like this is like what you're doing with this is so cool, and you know there's a lot of fly fishing podcasts out there and stuff. But like this, following this evolution of rafts and river running and drift boats and wood boats and like it's so cool to, you know, you've had a lot of my heroes on there and uh, it's really fun. There you go. Yeah, that's that's the goal. I think it's just you know, and there's some people that obviously aren't listening and they don't care aren't too interested in this, but yeah, for those that, uh, maybe there's somebody who hasn't run, uh, much whitewater or build a boat or it's, it's like planting the seed just to realize like, okay, yeah, you're, you're making it clear that even if you're a total, you have no skills at all. There's people that literally have built sweet boats. Oh yeah. Yeah, for crazy. sure. Which is crazy. For sure. Nice. Yeah. Well, let's see. What else do we have? Anything else before we start to kind of wrap this up? I, I kind of want to touch on, you know, your boats. Do you want to just go through your boat models really quick? I mean, I know you have one called the um, the Trapper. Do you are they do they all have cool oh, names? No. So the Trapper is not not one of mine, but oh, the Trapper not. definitely. Yeah, that's that was in Roger's oh, book, okay. and that's like a. I don't I don't offer a plan for that, but Roger does. Um, so on mine, if we just start from like the maybe the beginning of evolution there for, with my boats, it starts with the drift pram, and that's the um, that's the small one we talked about in the beginning with squared off ends. You don't need, necessarily need a trailer. Um, it's a low side kind of two person boat, two people and a dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, good day tripper or like an overnight. And then a one up from there is a is a little bit bigger design of that, and that's a fourteen footer, um, the Fly Fisher Skiff, um, which is pretty popular as well. And I have that boat. Um, I use that boat on lakes a lot, and I run a motor on it. So I'll run a five horse gas motor and a electric trolling motor, and we'll go around like really flat water and you know fish for muskie bass and stuff like that. Um, but it also runs great on a river and that, that, that boat has such a big displacement. It's probably the lowest drafting boat. Like that boat will draft three inches of water with two people in it. Yeah. And then, um, let's see the, uh, Pennsylvania drifter, which is my favorite boat. Like I told you in the beginning, you know, I'm just in love with the lines of a double ender, you know, that, that rockered shape, the, you know, the the kind of bottom curve and the top curve of the rails. And then, you know, it's curving in three dimensions around it. You know, what, what Roger says in his book when he talks about, you know, kind of quoting Woody Hindman is Woody Hindman designed that, that double ender profile. And it mimics the, the wave, the standing waves in the river and it fits in the environment. And it's like, yeah, that, that kind of rings with me a little bit. <laughs> so, I kind of see that too, and I love it. But the the Pennsylvania um, Pennsylvania Drifter is my take on the double ender. Little less rocker than like a Western one. Um, very pleasurable boat to row in all water types. Like in white water, it's great. It's like it almost feels like a big kayak. Um, and then in and even in flat water, it rows great, and it just looks great on the water. And lastly is the my last well there's two more there's the solo slider which i actually designed for my daughter <laughs> and it's truly a pram and if somebody wants to test their skills on building a boat if they can do it if you can build that boat you can build anything any of my boats because the process is the same and it's very simplified um and i offer those plans really cheap and and it's kind of like a, like a like a first 
approach to maybe boat building. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're, they're, you need they're a like minimal fi- amount of materials. They're $50. Is it like for that plan? Is it like 50 bucks? That plan's 20 bucks. Oh, yeah. wow. So there you yeah, go. it's, it's, yeah, it's cheap. Um, and the, the drawings are like the same of my other boats and everything, but it's very simple. Two frames to make. They're identical f- dimensions. You know, two transoms, which are pretty easy to make. Uh, you need really straight cuts for your sides and your bottom. It goes together. I built one of those on a Saturday. Um, I have a friend who never built anything, built one in a weekend. Wow. And uh, it's a fun one. And it's a, it's a totally usable boat. I've had it down moving rivers and everything. Um, but we have a we have a pond here uh, near my house, and my daughter uses it on the pond, and and she fishes and takes her dog out there and rows around okay. it. So, so this is like a one cool. this is like a what like a less than ten foot long boat. Oh, it's tiny. Yeah, I think it's like eight feet totally end to end. It's yeah. truly a pram. Yeah. Um, and then lastly is uh, the river whip, <laughs> hmm. which is a giant. It's like. Um, it's almost like a sled, like you would see in Michigan or oh, like yeah. a Pacific Northwest, like jet sled. Yeah, I've seen. Yeah, yeah I've so, seen the picture. You got one that's on your website. It's kind of got red on it, right? Yeah, red and blue, and yep. it's like, yeah, it's a uh, painted up almost. I kind of, I kind of stole a little bit of like the Grand Canyon. Exactly, that's what stories. it looks like. I was going yeah, through that. <laughs> it looks awesome. Yeah, <laughs> um, but that one's a, intended to be motored, but can be rowed just as well. And, um, what I do with that one is I run it up rivers with a, with a 10 horse motor and you can run a, up to a 20 we've had on it and run it up rivers, turn the motor off, pull it out of the water and row down and fish yeah. and drift fish. So, huh. um, it's fun on lakes. It's, um, it's huge. It's got a big wide bottom, um, is lots of room inside. Is it a flat? Yeah, Does it have a rocker? Flat. There's no, ro- there's not really a rocker. Very slight. There's a little bit of rise at the at the uh, transom Front. end to oh. give a little bit performance on plane, um, and but not much. And then the front does have rocker um, to yeah. help it also motor and to to be rowed. Gotcha. So it gets and so, it, get, it does get up on plane. It will get on plane. Yeah, I have a ten horse uh, of an old uh, 1950s prop motor, 1950s oh, nice. Johnson, a Johnson, and it, yeah. it gets. Yeah, it jumps right up, and with two two people in it, two dogs, bunch of gear, it, it hammers. It's it's a there really fun boat. There you go. And I have That's a lot cool. of lakes near me, so that was that was also like I need a lake boat. Yeah. So let's design one. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. Nice. Uh, well, that gives us a little rundown of your stuff. And before, and I, I'm not sure I heard you talking. This might have been a while ago, but this I'm just curious about the movie, the Cicada movie. Is that something no. you, you did a while ago? Yeah, how much time you got? Because uh, the cicada the, thing is a whole another whole thing. obsession. Yeah, let, let's uh, yeah. Let, let's leave it. I think what I'll do is put a link to that podcast. <laughs> what, what what was the podcast that you were on that that you guys talked about that? It was the uh, remote um, remote no. Um, oh, remote no pressure. Yeah, those guys too. I think that's uh, those guys are from Michigan. Yeah, I was on there with that. Um, just briefly, I guess yeah. the, the brood V was uh, brood V is a uh, is the name of a brood of periodical cicada. Um, that was happening here in 2016, and, and when I say here in, in Western Pennsylvania, and yeah, if, if you watch that film, which is um, and you can put a link up to it, yeah, 15 minute film or so, um, four of us made it, and um, I had two of my wooden boats in it. We actually built one boat for that film, and we ran um, we ran that river I mentioned, the Okagani, and um, we had just prolific emergence of these periodical cicadas so it was all dry fly fishing with flies that are two inches long two inches and oh yeah damn and what what species what were you catching so uh we have some trout in there some smallmouth bass and then um when you when when everyone says fishing cicadas at my i just go straight to carp because you're catching up to 20 25 pound fish on top and it's if you go watch the film, you'll you'll hear me talk all about it. And uh, again, my my heart rate's rising now thinking about it. So, um, but that's another thing, and kind of chase that around wherever it's happening every year. So. Oh, right. Really? So, so it happens. So, cicada, you can find it every year. You can find a hatch of him. Um, you know, there's there's a few years where you can't, but if you look hard and you do some research and, um start hunting for it you can find it 
you can find emergence uh, where it's going to occur. And then you got to do a little bit of work to find what water's nearby, if there's bugs nearby it. And if there is, I can all but guarantee you there's going to be fish eating them. Yeah. Wow. That sounds yeah. crazy. So it's, we, so you've got, you got plenty of uh, fish footage on, on that 15 minute video. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's lots of fish foot, footage on there. There's a lot. There's a, I wrecked a truck in that video. Wow. Uh, there's drift boats in that video, and uh, there's uh, lots of fish. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Okay, I'll yeah, I'll link out to that one for sure. We'll we'll take a look. Nice. Well, before we get out here, anything else we miss? I mean, we were kind of, I was trying to hit on a little bit of that, you know, if somebody wanted to get going and, and the, building a boat yeah. and an idea, any other tips or, uh, you know, before we head out of here that you want to give a heads up? I mean, you, you noted a ton of resources. I think like, it yeah. feels like we have a good information to get going. You do. I mean, your, your, your podcast helps with that too. I mean, you know, i not, I dropped a lot of names of friends and, and others and like, I, I love to see everybody else be successful at this stuff and everybody's so good and, and open with information. So, you know, and that goes, goes for myself as well. If any of your listeners are curious or want to know more or, you know, need that kind of talk through confidence to, can I do it? Can I build a boat or, or whatever? Just, just hit me up. I'm available. Yeah. Um, send me an email, drop me a line and maybe we'll have a phone call and talk. And man, I, I've had some, I've even had some semi-local folks visit, you know, and we stood in the shop and, and talked through it and worked through some things. So, um, totally available. Love to see the progression and the evolution of this stuff. And, uh, you know, thanks for what you're doing as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, this has been fun for me and I'm, I was just looking this morning. I'm, I'm slowly putting together kind of a big, uh, kind of like an epic blog post that kind of brings all of these together into one. I mean, you could search drift boats on the website and find all the episodes, but I'm trying to do a better job to kind of highlight what we've been doing. So I think, you know, this will go in there kind of under the boat building section. So I'll make sure when people read that, they can find you easily along with Roger and probably Ray. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep digging. I think we noted a few, I think Hayes, Hopefully I can, uh, yeah, just, ho- hopefully I can make it up to Dimmick and get him on again. And then, uh, yeah, I, we've got, I think we're on like episode uh, maybe 15 and we're probably under 15, but I mean, I think I could easily do another 10 solid. So if I did 10 I or know. so episodes, would you be good with that? Uh, 10 more Driftwood episodes? I think we could do it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I love it. It's great. I, I have some long drives, so it's always been, you know, I list, I like, I binge listened to a whole bunch of nice. just a few weeks ago. So Perfect. I love it. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, and I do, I do the same. It's kind of funny because sometimes getting well, not as much getting ready cause I run out of time, but just going back and listening, re-listening to an episode, right. You'd think that I, again, I would remember it, but there's so much in there that you just, you can't remember it all, you know, like oh, Roger, no, yeah. I'd probably listen to Rogers today again, just to be like, okay, what, what did, <laughs> what didn't we cover, uh, you know, today, but, um, no, Dave, this has been awesome. I think um, if anybody wants to connect with you, uh, downhomeboatworks.com is the best place. Yeah, yeah. Hit, hit my contact on there and send me an email, draw me a line, or hit me up on Instagram, uh, downhomeboatworks. Okay. And, and, uh, uh, and one to last talk to anybody. Yeah, before, you know, in the next uh, year or whatever, do you, we talked about some trips, anything, anything coming up with your business or, you know, uh, as far as anything going on you want to highlight? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not building it. I, I'm, I'm kind of content. My barn's full of boats right now. Oh, so really? I'm probably not building any for myself. Yeah. I have uh, that river whip, a solo and, uh, Oh, I have a double ender. So you're building yeah, right I now. Have, You've I've, got boats you're working on. No, no, no. I'm, they're done. They're, they're in the garage. So I'm not building or really designing anything new at this point, but, um, probably going to be dragging one out West next summer. Mm-hmm. Um, Kind of thinking Utah. And, oh, right. And like the the green. The and, green. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've been yeah. I've been thinking about somebody mentioned that the the green and I haven't done an episode. I think I'm going to try to track somebody down on the green. What's the? I guess there's yeah, obviously trout fishing, but uh, you guys be. Yeah. What, is this going to be more uh, more boating or more fishing? Oh, fishing. I'm yeah. I'm I'm hoping to kind of coordinate to see if I can find those the cicadas that are there. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> Again, oh yeah. Yeah. You're so you're the cicada thing is taken over, right? This is the, your your, <laughs> oh, your number yeah. one thing. Oh yeah, I mean, if you have you ever fished salmon flies? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I mean, I mean, imagine that, like in the middle of summer, it's the same kind of thing. Is this giant, giant bug, giant but it doesn't that don't it doesn't fly come well. out of the water. Yeah, they don't fly well. They come off the land, so they 
they're clumsy and they land in the water and the fish actually hunt them. And yeah, I mean, it's, Damn. if you like dry fly fishing, which is my first love with fly fishing, it's, it's just the top game for me. I, I love it. I think you just introduced a new, I mean, a cicada episode would probably be pretty <laughs> cool, right? There's probably somebody. Let's it, do it. Do, yeah, is there, is, I mean, <laughs> is there somebody, there must be like, I'm sure, it sounds like, I don't even know the whole thing, but I mean, these these bugs are kind of all around the country. I guess if they're in Utah, they're, I mean, it, yeah. Again, how much time do you yeah. got? Um, yeah, I've, I've fished seven different Eastern emergences of it, but there's periodicals and there's annuals. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very weird thing. And there's a lot of like scientific information out there on it. And these cicadas are prehistoric bugs. Um, the like plate tectonics and glacial shifts moved them around and then they kind of evolved in their own little zones where they were kind of deposited into the various broods and they kind of fragmented all up. So they have localized and isolated populations wherever they occur and it's crazy so it's just you, you know you, you chase these different broods down and like you know we fished brood v it's in one area but then not very far away but three years later you can fish brood eight all right and it, so it's very strange yeah it's crazy and, uh, yeah, yeah. It's so, fun so, stuff so they're all ice so it's not like a normal well, like the salmon flies, right? These bugs are all overlapping no. and in the water and mating and doing whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's different. Yeah, complete, and it's a seventeen-year cycle. Oh, and it's seventeen, so, which is another crazy thing. Yeah. So <laughs> seventeen. Yeah. So that thing yeah. you hit, so that one, <laughs> so this video that we could watch, uh, which was a few years ago, so that's not going to happen again on that exact spot for seventeen years. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. From twenty sixteen. That's crazy. Oh Think yeah. Of that. Oh uh, yeah, think of that. Yeah, and you know, I just I just fished one. I mean, I just fished one here this summer, in in a in a part of Pennsylvania and West Virginia, Maryland, and you know, we've been waiting for that one to happen. And then next year, there's nothing. And then a couple of years, there's a huge one. And so, and yeah, it's it's uh, I I I chase this thing, man. And I don't know anybody else who really chases it. So. No, I was just to say, who else? Who are the cicada chasers out there? There's not. You're you're up there with the. Uh, I'd say myself and three of my buddies. Yeah, nice. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll try to dig up some info on that as well because I think it's interesting. I'd love to see if there's some cicada yeah. hatches, you know, in other areas. But um, well, I'll let you get out of here. Uh, it's been fun. And uh, if anybody has questions, again, we'll direct them over to downhomeboatworks.com. And uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch with you. Looking forward to seeing the the next boat and the next design you have coming. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. And thanks for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all links, everything else we covered to date, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 260, 260. So uh, yeah, I'm not gonna, I guess I don't know exactly who we got coming up uh, next week right now, but I want to thank you for stopping by the show today. Uh, I want to say thanks and, uh, and hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.